you don't know me, I run the Roosevelt Institute, and um, it is really just so terrific to be with you here this morning in the House of Labor. Um, you could applaud if you wanted to, but anyway, many... <laughs> yes, we should applaud, we're here in the House of Labor. Um, you know, it was great um, seeing the building, the movement to meet the moment, uh, you know, sign outside the lobby both the building part and the movement part. I don't know, felt like we were in the right place this morning. Uh, thanks again to everyone at the AFL-CIO for this lovely space. So this morning, we are celebrating the release of a terrific new Roosevelt Institute report entitled Industrial Policy Synergies, Reflections from Biden Administration Alumni. It's hard to believe that it's already been, we're already at the time now where we have alumni, but if we have Biden administration alumni, certainly those of us at the Roosevelt Institute are here to celebrate them. And we are doing this in the midst of what we think of at Roosevelt as a major paradigm shift. For the first time in decades, we are seeing an administration that is taking bold action of which both FDR and Eleanor would be proud because it is an industrial policy moment. And the six alumni who have published in this collection had an enormous role to play in getting us there. In the first two years of this administration, the talented individuals that you'll be reading and hearing from today really helped build a new industrial strategy and to bring that to the forefront of US policymaking, certainly in a way that I did not think two years ago was going to be possible. Because as we all recall when this administration took office, the nation faced some of the most pressing challenges of our time. To recount, even though all of us remember it quite well, right? a global pandemic in its deadliest month, rising inequality, horrifying racial inequality, and racial violence, racialized violence, battered supply chains, and a climate crisis that of course has been ongoing for decades, but that finally forced us to rethink some of the fundamentals of our economy. And what the Biden team, the Biden experts, the Biden economic policy wonks concluded was, we can't meet those challenges if we leave it to markets alone. We, the public, our democracy, our government and our democracy, our government is our democracy, but we have to shape markets to serve the greater good. And we have to ensure that the industries we need to survive and thrive have the support of a whole of government approach in order to make that happen. And so as the essays in this collection explore, this means public investment, and it also means antitrust, anti-monopoly work, curbing corporate behavior when it becomes too dominant, limiting the power of extractive industries and activities, and making sure that labor has countervailing power. Because our industrial policy challenge is enormous, certainly unprecedented in my political lifetime, Here's the thing, our goal isn't just to drive growth, as important as that is. Jobs, of course, are critically important, but even good jobs are not our only goal. Our real goal is to unleash a self-reinforcing, inclusive, green growth dynamic. Jane Flegel calls it the green spiral, but a green growth dynamic that addresses the interlocking crises that we face. And this is the kind of industrial strategy that the Roosevelt Institute has been working on for at least the last five years. Thanks to many of the folks in this room, we've been a little bit ahead of that curve. We've been working with policymakers outside of DC and within this administration to push this worldview into reality. Some of you might remember that last October we gathered here in DC uh, where many administration officials and many outside experts helped make this case. It felt new at the time, right? We had Ambassador Catherine Tai, uh, obviously who runs the USTR, 
Wally Adeyama, who is the Deputy Treasury Secretary, John Podesta and Heather Boucher from the White House, and many officials from agencies across uh, the federal government, including Mike Schmidt, Jigger Shaw, Natasha Sarin, all of the folks who were both thinking about and working on implementation were here to sort of discuss what that might mean, and that was only a few months ago. They were excited then about what might be possible. I will also say that they were and continue to be properly sober about the challenges ahead. But today, right, just a few months later, we are seeing green shoots. The Financial Times, many of you I'm sure saw this, certainly the people in this room saw this, but it bears repeating. The FT reported last week that manufacturing investment is remarkably strong this last year. We've seen more than $200 billion in private funds to US manufacturing projects since just the last year. And the investment in semiconductors and clean tech is double the number from 2021 and almost 20 times what we saw in 2019. We all remember who was president in 2019. Not that it's causal, but I'm just saying a lot more investment now uh, than even a few years ago. And this is absolutely what we mean by public policy and public investment crowding in private investment. It's worth contrasting this, of course, to the post-2010 experiment, uh, experiment and experience of anemic job recovery and massive losses um, when, uh, when massive job loss um, the last time we faced this kind of international crisis. And so we really are in a new era. Um, we do need to get better as progressives in telling the story of this new era. I know many of us love white papers, many of us love statistics, many of us love 10-point plans, but the reason we brought uh, this distinguished group of Biden alumni uh, together today is to actually try to tell the story of what happened and what we are seeing and what they hope going forward. Um, we asked them to write about or to answer the following prompt. Um, how can macroeconomic policy, climate policy, trade policy, labor policy, inclusion policy, and competition policy yield better industrial policy and vice versa? That's why we call this the synergies report. Um, because we believe that all these things need to and can go together as challenging as that is going to be. Um, and so in this new collection, you'll get their answers. I'm going to preview just a few and then bring them to the stage. <clears throat> so in her essay, Samira Fazali really asks us to push beyond the old toolkit, old macroeconomic toolkit, which is really about reducing demand by raising interest rates. And instead, Samira suggests that in the last two years, government has, in part because they were pushed to, but government has really experimented and used many new tools like bringing companies and labor together to track and solve problems in broken supply chains and you'll hear more about what these kinds of experiments yielded uh, from Samira today. Or in her essay, Janelle Jones, who couldn't be here today, discusses investments in the care economy and how essential those are for ensuring that workers can actually get to work. Uh, and she notes that union representation at facilities receiving government funding, and this is important, folks, that, uh, that uh, union representation is a need to have, not nice to have. So if you are worried about labor shortages and if you're worried about a high-skilled workforce, then that is the piece for you. So uh, what makes this an industrial policy moment is the amount of agreement we are now seeing a remarkable amount of agreement on this way of thinking about structuring the economy from all, uh, from many, many, many experts and policymakers, both in DC and outside of DC. Um, of course, it is true that we are hearing some friendly critics warning us that perhaps we ought not take on too much. It would be uh, problematic or dangerous or perhaps folly to try to do too much all at once. And I'll say that these are real concerns and they deserve serious answers from all of us, including our distinguished speakers this morning. So with that, let me introduce them and bring them to the stage. Um, for their full bios, I think there's a QR code in your printed agenda, so you can see 
um, how unbelievably distinguished they are, but for now let me just introduce them with a one-sentence bio and then ask them to come up here and begin the conversation. So Samira Fazili served as Deputy Director of the National Economic Council for the first two years of the Biden administration, and she currently wears a number of hats, including as a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Jane Flegel served as Senior Director for Industrial Emissions at the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy and the Council on Environmental Quality. Jen Harris served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director of International Economics at the White House, working with both the NEC um, and the NSC. She is also a former Roosevelt Institute Fellow. And Sabil Rahman, also a former Roosevelt Fellow. You might notice a little uh, pattern here. We believe that paradigms are shaped by great people. Uh, but Sabil Rahman, also a former Roosevelt Fellow, served as Senior Counselor and Associate Administrator sorry, at OIRA, former President of Demos, also an est uh, esteemed law professor. Um, and our moderator today will be Todd Tucker, who is Roosevelt's Director of Industrial Policy and Trade. So I'm gonna turn it over to Todd, but before I do, um, I wanna thank you all again for coming, and I wanna thank the AFL-CIO for hosting us. Thanks in particular to all of the unionized workers here, unionized people here who are providing with AV, who are providing us with AV and with catering and with building service. Thanks to the entire AFL staff, and thanks especially to the Roosevelt Institute staff who are represented by New York News Guild Local 31003 who helped us pull off today's amazing event. If you'd like to tweet about the event, we would greatly appreciate it. The hashtag is Industrial Policy 2023. Who knew? Um, and with that, I'd like to invite everybody to the stage. <laughs> a second to get their mics uh, working. Um, uh, so first of all, thanks so much for everyone for coming to this panel today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to do it. And let's give another round of applause to the AFL-CIO. You've heard uh, the bios of our speakers, so I won't repeat that now. Um, but I want to note before we kick off that all the speakers today as well as the authors in our essay collection are speaking in their personal capacity and not uh, the views of their current employers or of the administration, just uh, to, be, to be clear on that. Um, so let's get this started. Um, each of you had a chance to work on really interesting projects while you were in the White House, um, from dealing with supply chain crises to advancing the biggest climate bill in American history to reconceptualizing trade relations uh, and to rethinking the way we do regulatory review. Um, we've got a diverse audience here and, and online uh, with varying degrees of knowledge of these different projects. And as Felicia said, it's good for progressives to take the time to actually tell the story of what we did and why we did it uh, and what we learned from it. So with that, um, I'd like to start off with Samira uh, and then go down the line here. Um, what was what, one of the defining projects that you worked on while you were in the administration? Why, in your view, did the administration think it was important to do it? And what were the lessons pertaining to industrial policy that you learned through doing? Um, well, uh, thanks, Todd, and thanks, Roosevelt, and the AFL for hosting us today. Um, so uh, the, one of the largest things that I worked on that connected to industrial policy was leading our work on supply chain resilience in the administration. Um, even on the campaign, the president realized that certain supply chains had an outsized impact on our growth and competitiveness and our national security. Um, and so he had issued an executive order within his first month of coming into office that said, we need to come up with a new way to work as a, as a federal family on diagnosing these challenges and coming up with action plans, action being the key word there, on how we're gonna close those vulnerabilities. Um, the, the kind of root of a lot of that had been that it, 
decades, and if you, as you saw in the reports that we issued on the topic, in sector after sector, it was very clear that decades of um, free market fundamentalism had really left our economy vulnerable and weakened our national security, and we no longer have the capacity to produce essential goods, goods that were important to our national defense, like the chips that guide our missile systems, um, or key to the health of our um, populations, like um, pharmaceuticals and the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, and again, you were finding in a lot of our diagnoses that the private sector and even government had really had very short-term time horizons they were always planning for and managing for. They were only focused on efficiency and things like security, sustainability, reliability, quality um, were not um, being priced in um, and incorporated into these plans. And you were having a lot of um, concentration risk. Sometimes that's like single companies that control the whole market. Um, and I think Tim's essay in the, in the compendium speaks to that. And sometimes it was geographic concentration in single countries. And um, oftentimes in countries that don't share our values and we couldn't necessarily depend on always being there for us. Um, the other piece of this was that these this fragility was not going to be self-correcting. Markets weren't going to fix it on their own. And in fact, um, the private sector kept coming to us saying, we don't know what to do. We don't have a plan on how to act. We need you to act in some way. And I think the chip shortage really brought a lot of this to the fore um, and to the attention of the general public and to the corporate community because you had so many companies that used chips in their products but had no idea how chips were actually made and got into their products. Even corporate leaders who were not paying attention to how they sourced um, these goods, how they designed their products to plan for sourcing those goods. And they, the companies themselves, lacked power over the wafer manufacturers to help influence their own decisions on where to build their companies. Um, I think another key, you asked us to draw down some lessons from this, and some key lessons included that these vulnerabilities were not theoretical and in the distant future, so all of us experienced that. And so while the, um, while the executive order had said, go fix these things for the long term and come up with structural solutions, we had to, in real time, build um, an acute supply chain crisis response function. <laughs> and um, I think some of the lessons we took from our work there is that, um, one, the private sector does not actually have the tools, information, or sometimes the will to solve these systemically significant supply chain vulnerabilities. Corporate leaders, as I said, didn't have visibility into their own supply chains. They didn't have plans. They didn't have benchmarking for what they should even be aiming for if they wanted to have a more resilient supply chain. Um, another thing was the massive coordination failures that were happening in industries or along supply chains. So, um, you often had to coordinate across a number of companies um, to develop a solution, and you needed an outside party to come in and drive communication, transparency, or coordination. And so one great example of when we did this, and I didn't write about this in the paper because the press had covered it so much, was our work in the ports. So if folks remember, the ports of LA and Long Beach were kind of gridlocked and goods weren't moving through them. You had ships waiting out um, at sea. And uh, what we did was pull the, like as the, to explain what it means to pull people together along the supply chain, we got the shipping companies and the trucking companies and the warehousing companies and the port operators. The entire supply chain is privatized. Like government is not running this stuff. And we forced them to come together. We appointed a government envoy, John Percari, and we said, fix this. You need to change the way you operate uh, between yourselves because you have higher volumes than you've ever experienced in the past, business as usual is not gonna cut it. And within three to four months, they had a 60% reduction in uh, the containers that were clogging the ports. We did that again in trucking. We said industry, labor, um, stakeholders get together, tell us the problems, tell us how you're gonna work together to fix this, and is there anything we can do to help? And in that instance, the Department of Labor said, we will help ap accelerate approvals for registered apprenticeships in the trucking industry because the stakeholders, industry and labor together, diagnosed that job quality was a problem and um, driving low, low retention rates. 
and that diversity and equity was a problem. And they all said registered apprenticeships can solve for that. And within three months, we had over 100 new apprentice programs formed, um, which would put 10,000 truck drivers on the road that year. And um, that would make a meaningful difference in closing the 80,000 uh, truck driver, uh, the 80,000 worker shortage in the trucking industry. Um, so I think one thing that really surprised us, honestly, is that we, everyone said supply side interventions take too long to have impact and to have effect, but in three, four months time, we actually drove meaningful progress and capacity expansions um, in a number of supply chains. So, uh, Jane, we'll turn next to you. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, both the climate policy office where you worked and your role in leading thinking on industrial emissions were both new offices and positions. Um, uh, before before you came on board. And I know you and I both share a passion for uh, how to thinking about decarbonizing the steel industry uh, and, and others as well. Um, what, what, what were some of the, the lessons that you learned in projects that you worked on? Thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, project feels too narrow when you're involved in such a paradigm shifting moment for climate politics and climate policy. But I recognize that everything would be a cop out here, so I'll try to be a little more specific. Um, you know, I think for the first time in history, the full power of the US government is aligned with and being marshaled to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. I can't overstate how actually, frankly, unimaginable that is to me, having spent my entire career devoted to this problem. Um, and importantly, Climate is no longer viewed as a narrow environmental market failure, but as an economic and national security imperative that also has the potential to help strengthen our democracy. Um, and this administration from the get-go um, really put workers and the building of a truly multiracial middle class at the heart of our climate strategy, which again, very, very novel approach to thinking about what it means to solve the climate crisis. Um, and, and this really infused everything that we did, truly, truly everything we did on climate. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples here. Um, obviously, as Todd knows, I am singularly obsessed with industrial decarbonization and revitalizing American manufacturing, as are many of the people in the audience. Um, and uh, number one, um, the Biden administration really t takes and has taken a whole of government approach to everything we do that involves sort of institutional innovation. So to your point, Todd, I think one lesson is that these things actually really matter. Having um, a regular cabinet meeting of people trying to outcompete one another on climate action was um, pretty astounding to witness. Um, you know, we, the industrial sector is um, often viewed as sort of difficult to decarbonize or just not, not thought about at all um, in, in the worst instance, which is particularly problematic since it is on track to be the highest emitting sector of the economy within a decade. Um, and so uh, the fact that there was somebody, uh, whether they were skillful or not will be an open question, <laughs> who was um, in a role to just sort of be responsible for figuring out what our strategy was going to be here was, I think, quite important. Um, and so uh, we pulled together a sort of a whole of government you know, a strategy on industrial decarbonization that involved not just supply side incentives um, contained both in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the IRA, $6 billion in decarbonizing um, American manufacturing, tax incentives, new and revitalized tax incentives to spur to spur cleaner manufacturing, but also on the demand side, um, incentives to companies and businesses to adopt these technologies. Um, uh, and we, Jen will say more of this uh, about this, I'm sure, but we understood that in highly price sensitive, trade exposed commodity industries, it would be nonsensical to have a domestic strategy that was not attentive to the broader international dynamics of these markets. And so, um, again, this speaks to both institutional innovation and I think the power of just sort sort of who you hire in an administration, that this was such a deeply shared commitment across the government that we sort of were able to work not just within the White House, but with the inner agency um, to develop a really holistic approach um, embodied, uh, for example, in the global arrangement on um, sustainable steel and aluminum, um, which, which I'm quite proud of. So I think 
in the industrial decarbonization world, the ability to tie together supply side incentives, demand incentives, um, incentives to ensure that as we decarbonize heavy industry, we um, clean up the air and water for local communities and um, invest in high quality jo union jobs was really critical. And I will say, on several occasions when we were trying to advance initiatives in industrial decarbonization, the first phone call I made was to the United Steelworkers and the AFL-CIO, which is um, perhaps novel in climate policy making spaces, at least into, to date. Um, and I'll stop, I'll stop soon, but the, the one other thing I want to say is that this is sort of an obvious fit with industrial decarbonization, but I also spent a lot of time working on methane emissions reductions and HFCs, um, and the same was true in those places. Our HFC action was not just about advancing a regulatory agenda, it was about leveraging the Department of Defense and GSA to procure cleaner alternatives to HFCs. It was about investing in American factories to construct the, to develop the alternatives. Um, and in methane, it was the same thing. It wasn't strictly a regulatory play. It was that and also um, investments in well capping um, and, and mine remediation to put people to work, to put union workers to work to help address these issues. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, it was really incredible, and uh, I, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, it's Jen's problem. <laughs> Jen, uh, for a lot of folks in the Roosevelt uh, family and audience, uh, the National Security Council is something we associate with spy thrillers and uh, action rooms. Uh, but you, you were brought in to do a, perhaps what was a new kind of project for the NSC, which is working on the uh, uh, American foreign policy for the middle class. And I think uh, as someone who's followed trade for a long time, it feels like especially that the shape and the content of, of the trade uh, initiatives that the administration has done are so different, really worlds apart than what we've seen for you know, the past 70 years. Um, what, what, curious as to some of your reflections on, on your time though. Thanks, Todd. Um, good to be in a room of, of a lot of friendly faces. Uh, you know, I think, frankly, if I had to summarize my how I saw my job description in the last couple of years, it was like Hippocratic, like do no harm. And that's a full-time job for US foreign policy for the last 40 years that has been, you know, uh, to put it in more diplomatic terms, uh, as, as my uh, panelists here have, um, quite divorced from a lot of our domestic aims. And, um, and so, it, you know, I, I, I feel a lot of um, kindred uh, spirit with Jane for many reasons, but one of them was that, I, you know, I did feel like it was the pointy edge of a, of a hopefully campaign that outlasts me to really turn some of the tectonic plates of how the foreign policy apparatus understands its role and um, and some of the the uncomfortable conversations I think that they're going to need to learn how to stomach. Uh, so my answer, Todd, to your question of kind of one project will also be a bit of a cop out, but it's an important one, um, and the, and it is to tether climate and trade policy more closely together, more actively recruit trade policy to be an affirmative part of our decarbonization arsenal. Um, and it, it has a couple of specific instantiations. There's, there's some points on the board that we've managed to make in that. But it, doing this requires uh, you know, a few different jumping off points, so I'll go through them briefly. First, uh, coming back to something I think Felicia said at the beginning, um, this is all premised on a view that markets are not ends unto themselves. Market access is a privilege, not a right. These are tools that need to be uh, brought into the service of larger national aims. Right now, uh, as Felicia mentioned, those aims are building, uh, rebuilding the physical, the energy, and the technology infrastructure of this country. Um, and if if you can meet me there, then the rest is, is pretty much execution. It's, it's questions of tactics and, and how. Um, but uh, you know, I think that, that is the, the, the fundamental shift that I think a lot of us in what I would call a kind of intellectual movement uh, are, are making. Um, I think another piece of this is to realize that you know, um, if, if 
build, rebuilding the physical, the energy, and the technology infrastructure of this country is at, you know, the project of the next couple of decades. Um, what, it, what, it, what are we leaving behind? What are we not doing? If that's what we're doing now, what are we not doing instead? Uh, and I think really it's a kind of singular obsession with a trade policy understood narrowly as about reducing tariffs. We did that. We did that in the 90s. Uh, whether it was right or wrong, like it's, it's done now. And uh, we don't, you know, the idea that we would spend, you know, a whole person hour, a whole agency's worth of person hours uh, continuing to kind of beat that drum is kind of nonsensical. Um, pop quiz, I see Sue Helper here. Sue, uh, any, any guess as to what the U.S. national average tariff rate is right now? Or Scott, I just, anybody? 2.3%, two, 2.3%, 2 2 exactly. Um, any guesses as to, you know, if you've, if you've polled kind of any cross-section sampling of CEOs, how many of them would sooner prioritize taking tariff rates fully down to zero over the course of years and trying to run that through the Congress that we have, uh, not the one we wish we had, as against uh, exactly what Samira described, getting people in a room together and figuring out how to uh, solve the shipping crisis, which is adding, you know, uh, often doubling the prices of a lot of, uh, you know, staple goods. Like, I'll take, I'll take the other side of that wager, right? Um, and, and I think that, that you saw that borne out in a lot of our international economic policy, things like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, again, our, their, their jumping off point is that we did tariffs in the 90s. The problems that we have right now, like supply chain crises, are frankly far more expensive to the bottom lines and the competitiveness of uh, any, any U.S. Uh, sector. And th th we need to develop new processes and, and muscles to go at these new problems. Um, third, we're not starting this party of a kind of public investment-led approach to crowding in private investment in uh, sectors we deem critical to economic and national security. Like, we are very late to this party. Um, I, I feel like my filter bubbles, whatever, my, my Twitter feed these days is just like one long vindication of the ways in which the U.S. is hardly, even now, post you know, these three generational pieces of legislation, leading, leading the party of, of kind of industrial policy and uh, public investment-led approaches to getting to where we need to be. Um, and I think there's a lot to, to, to be said on the how of, of these subsidies, and it's not just China. It's, it's a lot of our friends, Germany, South Korea, Japan, uh, these places have long employed industrial policy. They never left the practice, and they have a lot of gains to show for it. Uh, and um, you know, if, if you're interested, I can back it up with numbers and, and Twitter feeds later. Uh, fourth is that it's working. Um, you know, I, I, that's the other half of my Twitter feed, is, is it kind of like every morning there's more good news about more private investment crowding in just in the way that we had all hoped, actually outperforming, I think, even some of our wildest hopes and, and imaginations, which should remind us, you know, that we have some, we need to have some humility in the kind of live experiment that we're all a part of. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us didn't understand how much would be enough when we were figuring out, uh, you know, different in instantiations, versions of Build Back Better, uh, what ultimately became the IRA and, and CHIPS and uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, but you know, just, just to take one example, I think I saw a stat yesterday that suggested that uh, you know um, investment into semiconductor manufacturing is up 21-fold over a couple of years ago. That's not an accident. Um, so uh, you know, I, I would just kind of offer you know both a lot of green shoots, a lot of reason for um, optimism that, that the approach that we have found our way towards as a country is working uh, with, with a decent amount of humility, um, that there's a lot left in, in the shaping. We'll come to that in a minute. And then um, finally, uh, critiques. Uh, you know, this is an important national debate and how refreshing to be debating uh, that the how of reinvesting in our country again, rather than kind of trotting out tired debates on entitlement reform. Um, with with those who, who don't you know politically uh, align with us, um, but I do think that that the critiques need to uh, come around to any viable alternative that has any political legs whatsoever. Um, I think, and you know, I would sort of remind uh, those who we are debating with that the marginal efficiency, if we're going to get into a conversation about efficiency, of something that's politically dead in the water is zero. Um, so, uh, 
Again, I think that takes us to a conversation on the app, on the, which, you know, again, this is a broad topic area and um, with, we all need a lot of humility. I think uh, the piece that I can add the most value to on the, on the conversation about uh, sticking the landing is really in, in turning the kind of tectonic plates of U.S. foreign policy. I think we have a tendency to uh, spare no, sh no amount of diplomatic capital and the kind of rough and tumble kinetic questions of war and peace, and we're pretty good at that, especially, I think, as, as Democrats over the last couple of administrations from the Iran nuclear deal and the, the way that we've rallied the world to uh, contain that thorny problem to uh, what, what we've seen um, in, in unison across immunity across Europe and, and uh, Asia and the US in the Ukraine situation. Uh, I would like to see that same kind of diplomatic energy channeled towards uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of clearing the path for a uh, full execution of these three um, pieces of legislation and figuring out how to kind of narrow daylight with friends in particular. I think sometimes our foreign policy can be uniquely susceptible to criticism from allies and we need to develop a, a stronger stomach uh, on that front and a, a little bit of a, a thicker sense and reminder of, of what, it, what, it, what an alliance means. Um, and I can go into more details on that, but um, you know, I think I, uh, I've said too much already, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Um, Sabil, I'm old enough to remember 2019, uh, back when uh, the, we put out a report at Roosevelt called Industrial Policy and Planning, what it is and how to do it better. The, the thesis was that 90 to 95% of people would have no idea what we were talking about, and the 5 to 10% would hate it. Um, so we needed to, uh, to, to make the case uh, for a different way of doing things. And I think a lot of the same could be said for the Office uh, on Information and Regulatory Affairs at OIRA, uh, where a lot of, most people don't know about it. The few on the progressive side, especially historically, that do know about it, uh, tend to see it as action limiting rather than action forcing. And I think you're, you're one of a handful of people that have uh, both, in, both before you went into government and, and while you were in there and now that you're out, sort of trying to reconceptualize OIRA to perform a different function. Uh, so would love to hear uh, your reflections. Yeah, great, thanks Todd. And um, thanks everybody who just, uh, what a, just have to say, what a treat to share the stage and just be in this work with uh, such brilliant colleagues. It's just awesome hearing everybody uh, share their reflections. So um, uh, let me say a little bit about OIRA, which is you know not uh, uh, well known to some, less well known to others, and, and sort of the role I, I played in, in our larger sort of uh, crew in, in the administration was a little bit different. Um, so I ran the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which sits in uh, the Office of Man Management and Budget, and is responsible for uh, reviewing and coordinating uh, basically final approval and sign-off on every major uh, federal regulatory action. So climate, immigration, uh, all, every piece of uh, American Rescue Plan, you know, paper and dollars, you know, went through our office in that blitz of, uh, of you know, those first few months of 2021. Uh, so you name it, we saw it. Uh, that makes OIRA a really important uh, uh, function, but also kind of a gatekeeper, right, for uh, the ability of the government to, to do big things. Um, OIRA, uh, so, so that was kind of one piece. Uh, but for this administration, on part of the president's day one set of actions, you know, in addition to the climate executive order and the equity executive order and all these big uh, sort of uh, value statements uh, and, and mission sort of articulations from the president was a charge on day one to uh, rethink the regulatory review process, specifically to make sure that uh, we were doing the work that in a way that focused on the long-term impacts of climate, on human dignity and equity, on making sure government can respond uh, robustly to the crises that uh, we face and continue to face. Uh, and so we really took that as our charge. And um, uh, the thing, you know, in terms of project that I'd uh, highlight here is, uh, so you know, Jane uh, mentioned sort of the, the regulatory side that was sort of uh, often running in parallel to uh, the kinds of efforts that uh, Samira, Jane, and, and Jen were talking about. Um, we uh, embarked on a major process to, for the first time, uh, revise the, the basic framework for how OIRA reviews regulations. Uh, and this is sort of the underlying source code for how agencies are supposed to analyze, evaluate, and ultimately design their regulations. Uh, that uh, policy is now out in the world. It uh, came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were just very relieved <laughs> to see it's out and excited. Um, uh, but that has never been revised. And so to give you a sense, the original version came out in 2003 uh, during the Bush years. And if nothing else, just on in terms of like 
sci science and social science and data and evidence that has evolved in the last 20 years, um, a lot uh, is, has to change. To give one example for, you know, in the climate space, uh, the old uh, circular A4 is a document, uh, the, the old A4 has a discount rate of three and seven percent. And what that means is uh, when agencies are evaluating the long-term benefits and costs of, for example, climate regulations, where we're really thinking intergenerationally, and we're also thinking sort of existentially, right, about uh, it's not just, you know, any other regulation. Um, you're, if you're over-discounting those long-term effects, that means you're overweighting the short-term costs, and that means you're doing less than what you should be doing. Uh, the new version has uh, a different discount rate, 1.7. That might change further depending on how the peer review goes. Uh, but that's just one example of sort of the underlying analytic framework that needed to evolve. Uh, the other thing I'd mention uh, about the administration's approach to this stuff, and I think it sort of connects to some of the broader themes uh, that I'm sure we'll get into, uh, is I saw a lot of our role as trying to think through, you know, with our Western colleagues, how do we re uh, redesign the internal machinery of government to move and act at scale. And so some of that it was our role in helping support the kind of uh, coordination, right? How do we make sure multiple different regulations and funding opportunities ladder up to the kind of bigger impact that the administration is trying to have? Um, how do we uh, take the equity executive order and the charge to, to think seriously about uh, participation and systemic inequality? Uh, and incorporate that into policy design in a way that uh, is both meaningful and also, uh, 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 you know, kind of workable, right, given this, the scale and speed that we needed to work on. And so those are the kinds of things that then we would spend a lot of time uh, thinking about and experimenting with, you know, working with uh, our colleagues across the executive branch. Thanks, Sabiel. Um, so um, let's move on to a little bit of a discussion of responding to uh, some of the criticisms that we're starting to hear uh, as we move into the implementation phase. Um, you know, for the first year and a half of the administration, the, uh, a lot of the public debate was a sort of will they, won't they pass anything on Capitol Hill. And I think that necessarily limited some of our ability uh, in, in sort of the public sphere to have sort of debates on the pros and cons of, of different strategies. And it was sort of uh, presented in some cases as sort of a fait accompli. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting to hear, as I said, sort of more, more, more criticism. And I think you could probably boil these down into sort of three categories of criticism. Uh, one is the what, one is the where, and one's the how uh, of, of, of industrial policy. Um, the what objection is a per se criticism, right, uh, for, for the government taking this active role in shaping, uh, shaping markets. Um, we see that a lot sort of libertarians as well as libertarian curious folk. Um, the where is whether and, and how nationally oriented uh, this effort should be and sort of what is the role of the nation state and the national community in, uh, in thinking, uh, you know, in, in structuring our industrial policy. Uh, and then the how, you know, is, is, the, is the idea that we're trying to do too much at once. Um, you know, there's too many flavors uh, on the bagel, uh, one might say. Um, and, and of course, we're seeing rounds of critiques from U.S. trading partners as well. Uh, which, let's go down the line. Which of these concerns uh, are, are you the most uh, uh, you know, worried about, thinking about, and how would you respond to some of those criticisms? Samara, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, uh, no, no, it's fine. I don't mind. Uh, unless one of you really is itching to jump in, feel free. Um, I mean, I think in my first response, I took on a piece of the what. It is the role of our government to keep our people safe and to lay the foundation for strong growth. Um, if market forces alone are not able to do that and in fact weaken our national security and weaken our, our growth and competitiveness, then that argues for government to take a more active role and then the question becomes how and what, like what that role should actually, like how they should shape their role. I think some of those critics assume that um, what um, the proponents of industrial policy or government playing a role in market shaping are saying is government has to do everything, and that's not what I see going on right now. I see instead government saying we want to alert, work alongside not just the private sector, but civil society, like with the American people, and shape markets to drive towards the kind of outcomes we as a country and a polity are trying to achieve. But. Um, it's the how critique that bothers me, the everything bagel stuff the most. Um, because 
uh, I think it misses the forest from the trees, and I kind of understand why people are having um, this concern because um, my generation has never lived through a moment in which we actually invested in ourselves as a country. Uh, we've been stuck in an austerity-driven um, public politics and uh, political culture, and so the fights of the past four decades or so have been about how do we divide an ever-shrinking pie of resources and instead, we actually have a moment to say, let us make a generational investment. I mean, Sibyl just said, on the discount rate, we are changing the way government um, analyzes things so that we can think generationally. And we weren't able to think generationally before. We were only able to think short term. Um, we didn't have an investment-oriented fiscal policy. And so people were fighting over these shrinking pies. And now instead, Communities are able to come together and look at the problems they're facing and actually drive towards solutions. Like there is an incredible incentive there. It's a productive energy that is formed at the local level. For those of you who don't know, I, I have done a lot of my career in local economic development, local planning. So like I understand the federal, the national level and the local. People can come together and say, we have, we, we have been trying to solve lead pipes forever and now we get to replace it. Our kids have had asthma because they've been driving around in these dirty school buses. Now we can replace them with electric vehicles. And that process of productive problem solving is in itself going to generate reforms at the state and local level and how we do these things, how we, we implement. Because um, people can come together, vision, dream, and actually act. Um, so I think. For me, I see this as we have just unleashed an incredible wave of experimentation in America. And I deeply, deeply believe in democracy, like the ability for people to self-govern and, um, and figure it out through self-government. I think another thing I look at is in past moments when America has invested in generational ways, we also rebuilt our policy, our polity and remade our democracy. Think about you know, interstate highways or westward expansion and the New Deal. It, it started to redefine how we interact with each other as citizens. And um, this is, we are the first generation of Americans trying to build a multiracial democracy. Until 1965, we did not have a multiracial democracy. Until 1965, people like me couldn't live in America, move to America. My parents would never have been able to come to America without the 65 Immigration Act. Um, so uh, uh, I, I have a lot of hope in the how because I've seen America reinvent itself time and time again, and we've given people the tools and the incentives to do it right now. Jane, uh, one of the uh, great uh, gifts that you've given America by coming out of the administration is your Twitter account, uh, uh, responding. In I apologize. Both, both you and Jen, it's 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 great. It's great to see the two of you uh, with with a with a voice now that you can use in the public sphere. Um, so, your reflections on the criticisms? Yeah. Um, quite frankly, uh, like uh, rather than let me just say, taking a step back. Um, I actually think the greatest threat to the experiment that we are humbly embarking upon is the sclerosis of our democracy and the distrust in our public institutions. And to Samira's point, I think what we are trying to do here is rebuild and revitalize those things. Without a functioning, healthy, vibrant, multiracial democracy, it really doesn't matter what we do to try to tackle the climate crisis. It will not work. Um, and there are a couple of ways in which that is true. Um, I think for climate, one of the things that is so tough is the temporal anxiety. By the very nature of the problem, because every tenth of a degree matters, because every pulse of emissions matters, nothing is fast enough. Nothing will ever be fast enough. Um, so the question is, in a world of very real political and economic constraints, how do we move as quickly as possible while keeping the flywheel spinning to enable future more aggressive action? Like, even with the IRA and the IIJA and the CHIPS Act, even under the most optimistic scenarios, we, they by themselves will not be enough to achieve the president's climate ambitions. So the question is, what future action do they enable? Um, and that, that will require, by the way, a functioning, healthy court. <laughs> um, that will require um, 
you know, uh, 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 policymakers and politicians who are accountable to their constituencies and the material interest of their constituencies. Um, that will require much more affirmative and healthy community engagement at the local and state level about the kinds of projects communities want um, and project developers and governments who are responsive to those needs on the front end. So not to raise a new <laughs> critique, and I wouldn't call this a critique, but I do think it is actually the fundamental challenge, not, not the flavor of our bagels. Um, uh, uh, so that, that's sort of what I'm concerned about. Um, and, I, and I think that the administration is taking an approach here that is the only one capable of, of tackling that challenge. Jen. Sure, I, I'll speak to the, the where, um, probably a great advantage. Uh, so specifically, I'm talking about uh, people who are clutching pearls over the idea that, that uh, the U.S. is like, stealing somehow um, investment that rightfully belonged to other countries uh, and or that we, uh, in the, the doing of uh, these three pieces of legislation, are instigating some kind of race to the bottom of uh, corporate giveaways. Um, I, I, I should start with, I think, two asterisks. One, uh, I, I mean it when I say again, how refreshing to be in this debate rather than you know, talking to uh, the ghost of Paul Ryan about entitlement reforms. Um, but uh, I, I also, uh, I think I want to, you know, uh, put some wind in the sails of uh, efforts like Roosevelt's, like um, uh, American Economic Liberties Project, like Barry Lynn at some, at some point uh, on making sure that, that we have strong antitrust and, and pro-competition policy uh, as, as the other side of this coin, because it, 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 it could well be the difference maker um, in how this history is written. Uh, sorry, so uh, back, back to the, I think, the, the basic answer to these two concerns uh, that, that are really coming from the rest of the world and uh, the Peterson Institute. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up there, and they have really good food. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, it's it, the answer is a fewfold, and uh, not for nothing, you will hear Jake Sullivan lay out, I think, the answer tomorrow and really point a North Star for a new generation of U.S. foreign policy, and that's a big deal, so I hope you all tune in to hear it. Um, I no longer work for him, so I won't front run what he will say. I will just give you my view on the matter, which is... Um, that uh, for a long time the world has been asking the U.S. to step up. We have. Uh, we have put forward generational investments in, in, in climate. Um, there are some very narrow slices of, of thi uh, things like the IRA that um, put U.S. taxpayers in the front of the line for uh, investments that they are financing. I personally make no apologies for that. I think our president makes no apologies for that either. Uh, and also, it was the price of, of I think, uh, getting this legislation, this legislation done, point one, point two. Uh, when you look at the positive spillovers that this, the, uh, this work will have for everybody, the rest of the world, I think BCG, uh, their, their analysis was that you could see uh, the IRA alone bend the cost curves of clean energy uh, technologies across the board up to 25%. Everybody's energy uh, across the world gets, uh, gets made 25% cheaper thanks to the investments of the IRA, potentially, if we, if we get this right. Uh, that should more than compensate for whatever kind of guff we're talking about on, on a set of uh, domestic content provisions, by my math. Um, and then I think probably the largest point is that uh, more is more. Uh, I think the world has just uh, now surpassed $1 trillion of annual investment in clean energy um, technology, and we need about $4 trillion annually, says Bloomberg Clean Energy um, Finance. Uh, so that's just an open invitation. I think it allows uh, someone like the National Security Advisor to say, not only are, do you have agreed our permission at Europe, uh, and, and all of our allies to, to sort of do it too. We need you to do it too, and in fact, we're gonna help you. And we're going to start reorienting US foreign policy around taking the idea of green industrial policy global. Um, and uh, because we believe that, that the, it's an out of, the, the metaphor of uh, instigating a race to the bottom on, on um, subsidies is just the wrong mental model. This is really a matter of how all of us uh, you know, uh, put forward the, the public investment at the caliber needed to pull off 
entire new, uh, create entire new supply chains that don't really exist. And by uh, a lot of people's math who are smarter than I am on this problem, they say, you know, we're about a quarter of the way there, so join us. And uh, do we have the tools and, and the kind of instincts to, um, you know, fully make good on that? Not yet, probably. Uh, I think it looks like making sure that institutions like the XM and the DFC are fit for purpose. Um, if we are, you know, we, we do need a set of carrots as well as sticks when I, when I talk about tethering climate and trade policy more closely together. Um, you know, there are three kind of material tools that states have to move other countries in their direction at any time, right? Money, which as a direct appropriation matter, Congress does not seem to be in the mood to give out to other countries on climate. Last I spoke with um, uh, Special Envoy John Kerry. Uh, and uh, violence, which is uh, probably uh, no one's first resort. And market access, because of control over one's borders. And the idea that we have not more fully put market access on the table uh, in, in the effort to decarbonize uh, at this point in the climate crisis, I think is policy malpractice. Um, so I do think that you are beginning to see through things like the, um, the Green Steel deal that Jane mentioned. Uh, through efforts uh, that I know some, several of you are, are following closely and involved in to think about what a border carbon adjustment would look like in this country. Um, you are beginning to see kind of uh, the enlisting of market access as a meaningful set of material incentives and disincentives to uh, hasten uh, decarbonization around the world, and I think that's uh, to be celebrated. Uh, great, thanks. So um, I. I I want to go back to the, the theme of democracy that uh, Samira and Jane were talking about too, because uh, it's it's the bigger picture that I think is worth just kind of holding on to, right? So uh, when the president uh, ran his first campaign, uh, he talked about you know, this the whole suite of crises as partly a defense for for the idea of democracy, not just sort of that we get to set our own fate, but also that uh, in a democracy, government actually has to deliver the things that the democracy calls for. Um, and so when we are talking about industrial policy and, and these investments, it, it really matters whether uh, uh, the, the, those um, impacts, uh, who are they for, how are they felt, and that they feel real. You know, the energy that Samir was describing on the ground is, I think, a really important goal. And I say all that by way of preface to say, you know, I think um, there are real questions, right, about how we go about designing and uh, uh, institutionalizing, you know, participation, equity, uh, making sure that uh, these impacts are, are kind of spread far and wide. Uh, but th we should have those conversations, and that's exactly what I think the, the sort of um, uh, expansive uh, vision and opportunity allow for us trying lots of different things. Um, you know, it's worth remembering that there, it, you know, some of the criticisms about how this stuff might have worked in the past, those are old, that's old machinery. That's machinery of government that was built uh, often built by uh, people who did not want government to succeed in precisely these goals of democracy and equity and uh, transformative investments in political economy, right? We are living with an old uh, legal and institutional regime around, you know, uh, permitting, say, or around um, uh, uh, local participation. But we have lots of other ways that we can do all of these things. So one of the things that we did um, uh, in our very first uh, report to the president uh, for the equity executive order back in summer of 2021, uh, was we, we did an analysis about how how one might do equity and participation in a way that's uh, actually effective and impactful. And one of the big recommendations we made, which I think you know, agencies have uh, started to do a lot of great experimentation with, is that uh, meaning, participation has to be meaningful, has to involve all of the uh, the communities who are impacted, but it should be it should happen at an earlier stage in the process. So, to, you know, in the rule writing uh, space, for example, by the time a rule goes for notice and comment, it's way late, right? What you actually want is you want people in the room early when the policy is being designed so you know what are the needs that different communities have. How do we build that in? Let's try a few different uh, alternatives and then see, w you know, what that, uh, what the actual and final policy should look like. Same holds for industrial policy, right? We should have those conversations at a sectoral level, at a regional level, right? Not at the neighborhood level, right? Um, and so those are all things that we have in our uh, power and capacity to do. And so I think uh, kind of in terms of the, the criticisms that we are facing or the challenges we face ahead, I would just sort of really uh, hope and encourage, you know, uh, the intramural debate, as Jen said, uh, but really focused on like let's try these different ways of doing things because it's going to be our job, you know, this this policy generation's job to innovate the new models of how government functions in order to make this stuff work. 
Can I, can I just uh, put them on that a little bit? In, in, in this legislation, you have funding for it for community-based organizations. There's like technical assistance funding that enables them to be part of this experimentation and design process at the local level to build their technical capacity to engage in really weedy discussions on water or highways <laughs> um, or broadband. Yeah, and I think that actually what Sibyl and Samira are saying is a good plug for, uh, for our co-author, Janelle Jones, who, who writes about the value in thinking sectorially uh, when you're do designing industrial policy and, and also the value of, of uh, if, if, if you're concerned about procedure fetishes, uh, a good way to get around that uh, is sort of thinking materially in terms of ways of dealing in workers and communities into the benefits of these, uh, of these uh, programs. Uh, we're, we're, we'll do one final kind of lightning round before opening it up uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, two of my colleagues will, if you raise your hand, two of my colleagues will come around and, and give you the microphone and uh, we'll ask you to, uh, to give your name and identify your organization uh, before asking your question. But, uh, so get ready for that, I'll give you some time. Um, but I uh, want to go to sort of a lightning round of what each of you see as sort of the major unfinished business, one or two items that you think, uh, you know, we have a room full here of, of think tinkers and labor leaders, uh, NGOs, journalists. What are the things that uh, we as a community on the outside should be thinking about and socializing uh, in, the, in the months and years ahead uh, to help kind of get to the next level? Let someone else start. Jane. Uh, okay, I'll say something. Um, I am, uh, I am, I think I am not concerned about singularity of objective in how we move forward with climate industrial strategy. I am concerned with clarity of objectives as we move forward. Um, and one place where this manifests is around the kind of fear of Solyndra, the fear of the fear of Solyndra. I am irritated that I even said this word, um, but I think if we're looking specifically at the loan program office, the purpose of that program is to take on technological risks that the market alone will not. If that, if, if the programs that are supported by this administration and by this government through that program all succeed, we have failed. So, and I think, I think understanding that communicating expectations of failure and trying to push the government to in fact fail faster um, needs to be a core part of how we think about not just climate industrial strategy, but quite frankly, about industrial strategy more broadly. Um, Let's all applaud. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, completely violently agree, obviously. Um, and I, so one, one thing that might help the problem that, that Jane just spoke to is if the public got a greater share of the upside, right? If, if like, if, the, if we were able to say Tesla to every time they said Solyndra, meaning, I mean, their stock price has been weird lately, thanks to some management <laughs> challenges, but like, you get the, the, the directional point, right? Which is that, uh, you know, if we had greater public equity, we uh, would allow our politics to share in the upside of some of these uh, risky, uh, rightfully risky bets. Uh, that would be one, one, I think, big piece of business that could be helpful. Um, and it, I also think, uh, a really unsexy, really crucial part of this, I, I put some words to more count to in, in the piece that I wrote uh, that Mona lift up, is kind of building out a, a, um, a taxonomy of market shaping tools. Uh, I would um, commend the new uh, center, ironically, at the University of Chicago, uh, <laughs> dedicated to market shaping. Um, and, uh, and, and it's really building out things that, you know, Jane and others were really pioneering on in their time in government around clean procurement to include things like contracts for differences, include things like uh, a lots of different ways of guaranteeing off-takers, which is super important when you're having to build entire supply chains at a time across numbers, you know, a number of different vertical uh, nodes in a given supply chain, um, things like price insurance for uh, upstream commodities that you know need to be built out uh, at um, a clip that we've, we've yet to get our heads around, and I know some some um, institutions have, have, and audience have written capably on. Uh, there's a, a suite of these kinds of muscles, uh, and that really require not necessarily require, but would be awfully nice if there were you know new authorities 
from Congress on. It does, it's not a money problem. Uh, it's not really an appropriation issue, but I do, do think that a cleaner set of authorities to do a lot of this work would be helpful, and really it's it's in giving comfort to some general counsels inside of a lot of the agencies that are, are a little bit uh, gut shy to, to sort of read their existing authorities in the right light. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. Well, and speaking, I mean, speaking of the, the race to the top, uh, this is an area where some of our European friends are ahead of us in terms of the public equity ownership and stakes like that. And contracts for differences in the UK is... Yeah. And I would even think about like the, uh, oh, what was it called, the America Competes Act that allowed all the prizes and competitions yep. to be unleashed. Very and much. Uh, you could imagine another piece of enabling legislation like that that's very broad, lays out. Uh, these kind of uh, market shaping tools and encourages agencies to experiment with different authorities and tools. Like you said, it's about authorities, it's not about funding. And, and cross-agency learning, because there are agencies that do have these authorities and have been using them in much more creative ways than others, in part because they are insulated to some extent from the politics that other agencies are grappling with, and so helping to create the political space for more experimentation even with existing tools. And I will plug that the... Um, the appropriations bill that just passed, um, just passed, passed recently. Um, I have a 10 month old, so what is time? Um, but, uh, but did direct the Department of Energy to launch a pilot purchasing program for carbon removal, which is like quite a novel and exciting thing that I would encourage folks to pay attention to. Uh, great, I love the experimentation idea and learning idea too. I think there's a lot of stories to be told and sort of uh, just like on the ground things to try out between not just government, but sort of government and civil society working together. Uh, the other, the two other things I'd mention is, one is I think it, it would be really valuable to sort of keep thinking about what is this, what is the new sort of legal authorities or the new uh, kind of uh, govern, governance machinery that we want so the next time there's another legislative moment, which, you know, I am an optimist, I believe there will be another one um, in some years, uh, that would be great to be ready for that. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, you know, there's a, uh, we should just be eyes open, right, that we are also living in parallel at a time where there is a active, mobilized, uh, revanchist effort to sabotage everything that we just talked about. Uh, some of that is coming from the judiciary, some of that is coming from uh, people waiting to uh, uh, abolish the civil service. Uh, if you don't know about Schedule F, you should. The civil service is a crown jewel of our democracy. We cannot function as a democracy without the talented federal civil service. Um, we need to be prepared to prosecute the case, not just for the substance of what we talked about, but for the very fact that as a multiracial democracy, we deserve a government that serves the multiracial democracy. All right, um, uh, now I'm gonna say two things. I had one, but Sibyl just made me, I just, I just need to foot stomp on the career civil service. The actions we were able to take to solve the supply chain crisis should remind people that government is capable of doing big things on behalf of the American people. And that rested not on your political appointees, but on the shoulders of the civil servants. And so really making sure that we're not attacking them, but lifting them up and pulling more and more people into service and not burning them out is just so critically important in this moment. Go ahead, please. Um, but, the, I'm, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna take his like darkness and turn it into lightness and say, I actually think there could be more bipartisan um, work in the, some of these industrial policy spaces. And one space I would look at and continue to track quite actively is um, pharmaceutical supply chains, active pharmaceutical ingredient, ingredients, um, essential medicines, generic medicines, I think coming out of a pandemic, everyone recognizing how um, vulnerable we are to these products all being made basically in India and China. Um, um, there uh, is like a, a, a clear kind of national security and health and preparedness rationale here. Plus, um, there is so much innovation and manufacturing happening that we could actually be quite cost competitive. So we're not gonna, reshore um, some of this and raise costs because there's technological innovation happening that could actually drop price and make us more competitive here on the process innovation side. So I, I, I think that there could be some bipartisan actions in even this Congress um, uh, where people could think about ways to help close some of the vulnerabilities in the pharma supply chain that all of us have been staring at and hoping we can work together on. Plus, 
again, unplugged from government. HHS built whole new capacities under ASPR, the, 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 the office and that was in charge of pandemic response and preparedness, where they actually understand how to work with industry, how to build supply chains, how to work alongside, not instead of the private sector. And so we have new muscles um, being built inside the government that and new expertise that could be leveraged here. We're not fully um, working from a blank slate. All right, so we have uh, around 15 minutes for audience questions. Uh, Marissa's over here with the microphone and we'll connect you uh, if you had Didi over here on the other side of the room. If you have questions, we'll take two or three at a time. Again, uh, if you could say your name, your organization, and your question, uh, that would be great. Direct all the difficult ones to Jen. <laughs> Dave Bentley. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Rangel. I'm from Rethink Trade at the American Economic Liberties Project. Um, and I was curious about Jennifer's comment about how you can modify other countries' behavior. Uh, and I think that but you, the, the elements that you mentioned are right, but there's another one, which is law. And the problem is that the international economic law order that was created over the last 30 years basically did many things, but among others, is to make countries not to regulate their economies. Uh, and I think that an easy example of how this happened is the investor state dispute settlement system that basically has been used to punish countries that undertake environmental and climate policies. So I was wondering about whether you have thoughts about how that can be addressed by the Biden administration, by the US government, so that we unleash the potential of other countries also carrying out ambitious plans to contribute to climate change. Great. Take another one. Right. Back here. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, I'm Yuka Hayashi with the Wall Street Journal. Um, I have a question for Jennifer uh, about uh, getting along with um, allies uh, who are affected by these policies. Uh, Korean president is in town this week, and Korea is probably the country that's uh, most affected by uh, these uh, new uh, legislation, the IRA and uh, CHIPS Act, and they're also hugely affected by the uh, export controls of uh, CHIPS, and they have expressed frustration, maybe not as loudly as the EU, but they have. Um, so how would you advise the president to discuss these issues uh, with his counterpart, and what are the concrete steps that the U.S. can take to uh, get along with Korea and uh, other allies? Thank you. Sure. Um, glad you all are taking, no, we'll, yeah, let's go ahead. taking Jane's advice. Um, uh, so I'll take these in order. Uh, we should get rid of ISDS. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think President Biden agrees with me in, uh, in the in in his um, <laughs> In, in the, the 2020 um, election platform, I think that that was the position of the Biden campaign, and uh, you know, it, it, there was not a uh, decision to re-enter TPP, which would have been the proving ground for that. Um, I think that's a good thing, open for debate. But uh, you know, I think I would expect if I were wagering any odds here that any big muscle movements uh, around international economic negotiations where the question around ISDS were called uh, would would go to, um, you know, scuttling it in, form, in favor of um, letting governments um, do negotiations among sovereigns, point one, point two. You know, there's a, a lot of, I think, just basic reality on some of the, um, the, the big sectors where uh, you could see uh, investors uh, having a kind of ISDS-like claim um, are are not really making their decisions based on whether there's an ISDS regime in place or not. Right? Chile, uh, the Boric government, just uh, you know uh, is, is announcing the beginning movements of nationalizing quote unquote, scare quotes uh, their lithium sector. I, I say nationalizing because I think kind of requiring uh, a state partner is a pretty capacious light touch version of what nationalizing could look like and frankly very much the way of things in the oil and gas sector last time I checked like OPEC <laughs> is run by sovereigns uh, so you know I think that, that there's just uh, the problems the practical problems that the world is up against 
are taking the pendulum back in this direction anyway. Um, uh, and to the question of, of Korea, I think the, um, the ad advice is a couple fold. Uh, one, join us. Uh, please come up with your own green spiral legislation and, and set of public investments in um, green industrial policy. Um, we need you and uh, we'd like to help you. And uh, you know, I think help here could take a number of forms. There's a lot of this, you know, this to me, the climate is is kind of a it's a political problem and it's a technology problem. Um, and while we're you know we have our our share of political dysfunction, technology is still a thing we're pretty good at. I think you know a, a set of research partnerships uh, to help uh, Korea decarbonize their industry so that they are in better standing when a green steel club. Or, or the like is announced are, are the kinds of things that I could imagine uh, being pretty fruitful um, veins of work in the, in the bilateral relationship. Can I, can I add to that? Because the, the, the work that I, I did was a lot of blending domestic and international policy. So we thought a lot about how we want to, and, and as you know, this administration came in trying to bring those two together in new ways. And so we really thought hard about how we want to work with our close allies, like the Koreans, to build um, industrial policies for these like essential sectors in a way that could be win-win and could help strengthen these international alliances and partnerships. And um, a lot of that started from a fundamental of like, these alliances are important to us. We want to build them. We want to cooperate and develop shared visions and um, help to do some like shared problem definitions as well. And um, you saw us set up a number of dialogues to do that in, in the chip space and um, in other technologies. I think um, another piece of this um, has been to tighten um, integration between com countries by in fact inviting and encouraging their companies to invest in America and to build out and, um, and to bring their kind of technologies and, and manufacturing production processes here here in America, which is you know strong interest to a lot of Korean companies. And then finally, there's a, a piece of this in which America has a lot to learn from other countries. And so there's also a let's learn about how to do things together. And in particular, you often look see in Korea and in Germany, their corporations act in a more pro-labor way in their own countries and then come to America and forget all of those great practices that they deploy in their own countries, but instead, could they come here and adopt those exact practices because we are trying to innovate in creating a more worker-centered industrial policy and one that strengthens the power of labor or develops more cooperative mechanisms between labor and industry. So I think we have a lot to learn from our close allies um, in this space. The ones who, as Jen said, have been way ahead of us on the curve of like more full-throated um, national industrial policies. Great, all right, let's take a few more. All right. Uh, oh, for Jen, right? <laughs> Let's go with Ben Beachy over here. Thanks for your work and thanks for being with us. Ben Beachy, VP for Industrial Policy with Blue Green Alliance. Um, I want to go back to the Everything Bagel critique, uh, and, and I appreciate that Roosevelt offered us Everything Bagels this morning. Um, Please, in the back, yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, so clearly the premise a lot of a lot of your good work, uh, the premise of the three uncles of Iro, Bill, and Chip is that we can and in fact should advance climate action while we create good union jobs, while we advance racial and economic equity, while we build reliable supply chains. Um, given the heat that that has gotten, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about why that is good policy and good politics. Okay. Let's take another. Adam, over here, same room. Thank you, uh, Adam Dean, I'm a professor at George Washington University. Uh, following up on Todd Tucker's question about where investment is taking place, I wanted to ask a question about where within the United States we're seeing new investments, and this sort of, in the broadest brushstrokes, the difference between investment into blue states with strong unions and red states with right to work laws and very low union density, and where politically you would be most excited to see those investments. You see some people say that investing in states with strong unions will put unions on board with sort of a policy feedback loop. And other people are saying investment in red states creates new jobs that puts pressure on Republican representatives to continue to support these kinds of policies. 
but those are sort of at odds, right? Do we want investment in, in blue states or red states? Let's maybe take one more. Hi, Olivia DePillis with the New York Times. Um, this question has been asked before, but I love your thoughts. Um, how do you square all of the decarbonization work you've done in your various spheres with the administration's efforts on various fronts to increase the supply of oil and natural gas, whether it's through green lighting LNG projects or the Alaska Willow project or asking Saudi Arabia to please not lower its uh, production rates. Um, how, is that just a concession to politics or is there an industrial policy case for it? All right. Um, I can talk to Ben's question um, specifically. I mean, I think the industrial sector is a pretty good example of the genuine win-win-win alignment that we're talking. I mean, look, I I'm not trying to be Pollyanna-ish. There are trade-offs in the details of policy implementation, of course. Um, but in industrial decarbonization, you have a sector that is, as I said, on track to be the highest emitting sector of the economy. There is a huge imperative to, to decarbonize that as rapidly as possible. So like pretty obvious case for, for investments in decarbonization. Two, the vast majority of the highly emissions intensive facilities are themselves disproportionately in um, areas that are low income and uh, communities of color. So cleaning up those those facilities um, is, is good for environmental justice. Um, third, and Samira knows this much better than I do, but um, Manufacturing, reinvesting in manufacturing jobs and cleaning up the places where, manuf where manufacturing happens um, is how you rebuild and revitalize, as I said earlier, a multiracial working class. Those are clear benefits to workers. Fourth, integrating our industrial decarbonization with trade policy that closes the, frankly, carbon loophole by which other countries are exporting a bunch of their pollution into the United States um, can help to both increase the cleanliness of American manufacturing, which by the way is already much cleaner than, than much of the world, um, uh, and, um, and ensure that we are protected from, um, from pollution dumping, essentially, the import of pollution from other countries. So like, th that is an example where there is like quite clear alignment um, in, in a way where multi-solving actually like does make the most sense on policy substance. I think the politics of this are like pretty straightforward, especially for a problem like climate change, which, as I said earlier, we're not gonna solve with one whack of the hammer. Um, it is incredibly important to grow the um, coalitions and concentrated interests that stand to benefit from more aggressive climate policy over time today. And the you know long-term emissions benefits of our actions today are often not obvious, not felt, hard to get people to understand, but delivering jobs, cleaning up people's air and water, dealing with the problematic dynamics in international trade as they relate to not just competitiveness, but climate change. like. People will feel those things today in a way that should help build momentum for future climate action. I'm gonna take Ben's also if I could because um, uh, it, The, the legislation creates incentives for all of these stakeholders at the local level to put pressure pressure on the system to build the shit, right? To build the thing. And so you now have um, labor organizations reaching out to companies saying, we'll help you make a registered apprenticeship so you can get that bonus at our credit in the IRA. And community-based organizations working with companies and their local government saying, we want you to cite that solar field here because we're a low income distressed community or an energy community, you're gonna get a bonus credit for it, so we'll help you do it. And oh, you're having trouble figuring out how to get workers for it, oh, we'll help organize the training pipelines for you and the activities. And so it's creating the conditions for people to actually work together because you both give them an incentive and then as Sibyl said, there's like process and voice that comes along with it and creates a system in which building can actually happen faster because more people are included and asked to be part of um, the, the process and the project. Um, I think on the where in the US question, um, uh, I'll just be, um, I, I guess, like bringing a, a slightly 
grumpy reminder uh, of, of the kind of physics of uh, and the economics of some of these newer technologies and um, that they need to be clustered together to work, right? Like the, the idea of industrial clusters where you get the mutually reinforcing uh, benefits from um, CCS, from uh, hydrogen, and uh, from uh, direct air capture is, um, is real and, uh, you know, we need to see uh, a lot more forethought given to some of those application processes moving uh, in a way that will have co-location happen wherever it happens. Um, and I think uh, there, there probably is another set of economic um, arguments for making them happen close to existing industrial sites, so ports, you know, uh, and uh, whether they're blue, blue ports or red ports, um, you know, I think, uh, I think that there's good arguments on both sides, uh, and we're one country, and uh, probably the only way out of our dysfunctional politics is through it a little bit. So I, I have a lot more time for, uh, you know, seeing this investment set of investments go into a lot of red states, uh, as long as all of us help to uh, apply the, the right kind of pressure to make sure that those jobs are good jobs and uh, to, to fight um, to, uh, you know repeal right to work laws. I'm pretty buoyed by what I see happening in places like Wisconsin. Uh, it is possible, it's gonna be hard, um, but we should try. And also I also just, oh, you have, go just like very briefly on, on the trade-offs here, I, I do think, especially in the climate domain, we need to be like slightly more analytical. I mean, it's easy to flail around and, and footstop about trade-offs, but like the actual analysis of the impacts on rates of deployment of, for example, increasing wages or increasing domestic content suggest that the, that the impacts on rates of deployment are very minimal. I think um, Jesse Jenkins and Aaron Mayfield have done some analysis that like a 20% increase in wages in wind and solar will result in something like a two to 4% increase in costs of CapEx and have almost no impact on the rate of deployment and similar findings on domestic content requirements. So again, it's not to say that like there may not be some uh, some tiny additional friction, but I do think some of the flailing about could use a good dose of um, analysis. Um, on, on the where, I also think, I mean, the president is very clear he was elected to serve all of America, right? So we like want to see our country as a whole strengthen. Um, I live in Georgia, so I live in a red state. I, I, I see that there, there's real uh, potential here that the dynamics that are unleashed, even if the building happens in these right to work states, that in, um, you know, in, in the Bidenomics approach of running a high pressure economy with uh, really low unemployment, you've created conditions and structural shift in bargaining power, but from workers to, for, away from employers towards workers. And so you can see whole new organizing drives unleashed in former, in these, in these like, um, states with low unionization rates. So it's just like we've shifted the the power and the dynamics in a lot of parts of the country where people once thought you couldn't have unions. And so I'm excited to see what gets unleashed, um, even if some of this um, is happening in these like redder, um, quote unquote redder states. And Lydia, sorry, to your question, uh, I don't think that price chop is helpful to the transition or to kind of basic macroeconomic environment uh, on which our political discourse like rests. Uh, so I think the idea of, um, you know, uh, asking for sanity and, and not vindictiveness and a lot of OPEC decision making uh, is, um, is, is the right way to go. I think that there is a, a much healthier debate to be had where you're talking about infrastructure being laid that's going to be there for, for decades. Uh, but in general, I think we need to pay attention more uh, and, and certainly in the last couple of years we have paid very close attention to the price chop within a traditional oil and gas um, as uh, pretty harmful to, um, to the transition that we're all looking for. So I think with that, we are at time. Uh, I want to uh, ask you to join me in giving a round of applause to our speakers today. <laughs> Let's also give another round uh, of applause to the Roosevelt Institute and AFL-CIO staff that helped us out here today. 
uh, and also encourage you to get a get a printed copy or go online at rooseveltinstitute.org uh, to see uh, the essays that uh, that were put together, including by Janelle Jones and Tim Wu, who couldn't be here today, but really encourage you to look at their essays. Uh, thanks a lot. Have a great day.